You can live your whole life with artificial needs. We start hearing people about, well, I have to compromise this and I have to compromise that. Suddenly one day they're nothing but a compromise. And then they feel rotten because they were never encouraged to be honest about, look, I've been telling you I like this whole line. I don't like it. It's not your fault. I should have been honest. This is what I really like. And isn't it important that we do what we like instead of what's expected? But society tells you to do what's expected. We're supposed to accept all these compromises. Well, that's one way of keeping people in control. I'm not a believer that we have to do things in a compromising way. I believe there's no shortage of good quality people to share the best that you want to be and they uh, respect that and share the best that they are at the same time. Complimenting energies is a wonderful experience. When you recall a simpler time, what are you really looking for? I'll bet everyone in this room has thought about simpler times, right? Have you? Down on the farm. Down on the farm, all right? What was good about being down on the farm? Just hanging out and um, sitting and being in the forest. In the forest? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, what was good about that? It was really beautiful. It was beautiful? Yeah. Okay. Okay, close to nature. What else? What was good about another time? Inner peace. inner peace. What's inner peace mean? Being relaxed and at home with yourself. Relaxed and at home, home with, with yourself. yourself in the universe. Okay, so you didn't feel in conflict. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a quieter time meant an unstressed time. Mm -hmm. So what you're really saying is you'd like to recapture the times in your life that were unstressed, quiet, peaceful, mm -hmm. imbalanced, where everything was in harmony. Right. All right, what else? Carefree. Carefree. Yeah. Where you could be yourself without feeling that what you were doing was wrong or people were going to judge you or you're going to be reprimanded or <laughs> criticized. Right. All right? And then being able to appreciate everything else that comes with uh, not caring. <laughs> In other words, not having to care that what right. you were doing met anyone else's approval. It was just you. Yes. Okay. What else? Simpler. Uncomplicated. Okay, well, the times in life may be where, where you had less choices to make or the choices you had were more carefree, where there was more time for play and balance, where your life was more imbalanced, where it wasn't an arbitrary uh, construct, it was actually imbalanced. How many of you ever remember sitting on a porch on a swing when you were young? You did that? Do you ever recall those moments when you were just sitting on a swing or in the fall walking where there was leaves burning and you could smell or the spring, you know, mowing along with the smell of grass or simple things. What it really tells us is when we were looking for the quieter moments, the more meaningful moments of our life, and that's why our memory is so powerful because the memory is what we have to remind us of a reality that was essential at one time that somehow we've lost communication with. Our memory and those moments tell us we want balance. Because when we're in balance, when you're on a swing and you're sitting there and it's a nice summer night and you're just feeling that wonderful sense of, of being with nature and the stars and maybe your family, whoever's there, or yourself, there's no conflict. What is wrong with today's picture is there's rarely a moment in the day where we're not living through conflict. We have too much in our lives. Our lives are packed. A lot of it is clutter. Anything that shouldn't essentially be in our life, anything that's an unconditional part of our life creates conflict. Therefore, to lighten the process of growth, and to start our growth over again, making the right decisions, we have to get back to a more innocent time. Now, if that innocence is a moment when we can be more spontaneous and carefree without always having to put on a pretense or have an image to people. And think of the people who dress up in such a way that they always have to wear a suit and tie. They can never be carefree. That's when they like being out on, you know, in the Grand Canyon wearing, you know, uh, some blue jeans. Think of the people that, that want those moments. Well, my suggestion is that you start to put those moments back. But you have to look at what was going on that allowed the moment to exist. And that was the choice of balance. So it's an immediate way of rebalancing your life.
And you do that by the time that you need is a part of the time that you're going to unclutter. So you put things back in your life that declutter. You get rid of the clutter, you get rid of the unnecessary conflict, you get rid of the unnecessary uh, emotional negativity, and now you have peace of mind. Now you have those moments where if you want to go into a park and sit, you want to go into your rose garden and sit, whatever you want to do, you have that peace of mind. <coughs> well, there are people who live that every day because they don't invite in the wrong choices. They don't have to live by anyone else's standards. What do, you, what do we say, think or do, that automatically establishes artificial boundaries? People would like to grow, they would like to do more with their life, and then when they start, they say, yes, today's the day, I know what's wrong with my life, I'm tired of it being this way, it's going to change, boom, they hit a wall. And they look around, everywhere they look, there's boundaries, and they're thinking, I can't get through this. And then they start looking at why they can't. I don't have the resources, the knowledge, the support, the money, whatever it is. And these are all excuses. But they're excuses that you've used so many times. It will not be the first time. This is a repeating behavior. We establish artificial boundaries in order to keep ourselves from being free completely to be who we are. And part of the reason we do is because we've taken the lesson from everyone earlier in our life who also had boundaries. We watched how they manicured those boundaries, defended those boundaries. Institutions do the boundaries. Everybody's got these boundaries. And so we take our lesson from them. They created an artificial boundary. It worked for them, so we've created one too. So look for the boundaries. What are some of the other ways that we put boundaries in our lives? How do you automatically establish an artificial boundary? Huh? Being unconscious. What? Being unconscious. Be un being unconscious. If, you're not un if you're not conscious of your life, then you're, the unconsciousness or the lack of consciousness itself is a boundary. Mm -hmm. You cannot enjoy that which you cannot understand. Mm -hmm. You're never going to find that which you're not looking for. We like to hear about serendipity. In reality, it does not exist except for those who are seeking it. The whole idea of gestalt is that you're free and open to have a gestalt. The person that tries to figure something out without having an understanding of what their belief system might be doing and limiting their ability to figure it out is not going to have the gestalt. So you have to be focused on something and it's like a camera. An automatic camera, you focus at an image and it automatically zooms in and gives you a picture. But let's say you try to focus on three images at the same time and they're eight feet, nine feet, and 14 feet apart. It can't do it, you get blur. Very same way that you try to focus on multiple objects of, that are contradictory in your own life, you get blur. And then because you got blur, you're afraid to engage and it becomes a boundary. So what we do, we keep looking at all these multiple possibilities and they terrify us. Well, it's not the multiple possibilities that get you beyond your boundary. It's a single focus. Mastering the art of getting one step out there at a time. Just one step. That gets you outside the boundary. But we're in this society where we have so many possibilities. We have so much going on that we want a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But we don't engage it. It's just used as a way of, it's almost like a, a new age materialistic spiritualist journey. We sample things, but we don't engage them. That they're merely as crutches and distractions. You've got to have one focus. Now once you have one focus, and you put your attention and effort in that one focus, then you see what your new priority is. You see what your new commitment is. You've got to commit yourself to something greater than your dysfunction. If your commitment is less than your dysfunction, your dysfunction wins. If your commitment is less than your boundary, your boundary wins. If your commitment is less than your fear, your fear wins. You must always commit yourself to something greater than your artificial self or the artificial self wins. And that's where we have to get an idea of what we really want in our life. Because what you really want in your life is what you're going to look at. And that's where you're going to put your energy. And that's where you're going to put your resources. And that's going to allow you to go through and break through. If you start having all these ideas, you're going to do nothing. You're going to be a person that tries a thousand things, completes nothing, starts a lot of projects, completes nothing, 
goes to all kinds of workshops and lectures, has all kinds of relationships in a lot of different areas, and finds no real and ultimate fulfillment. That's not what it's about. It's about a single sense of focus. That gets you through. Now the single sense of focus can show you multiple options, but take one at a time. Otherwise you're going to overcommit yourself again, and then the very same thing, you're going to burn out. And baby boomers hate the idea of not having multiple projects all over the place. Why do you proclaim, I want A, and then spend all your time pursuing B? Did you ever notice people say they want something and then, but nothing they're doing shows that they want it enough to make it happen? Why do you think that is? Why? Fear of failure. Fear of failure? Feel what you have to feel. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown? Discomfort. Discomfort? What else? Time. Time. Scattered. Scattered. What else? Fear of change. Fear of change? Yeah. All the, you're correct about all these. All these are part of it. But remember, be honest about it. Whatever you focus on, if that's what you want, then don't do anything that denies a step towards it. And if you keep honoring what you want, then automatically you bring yourself back from imbalancing. If you want to be healthy, you cannot eat the junk. Therefore, when you start to eat the junk, you say, hold on a second, what am I doing? This is stupid. How can I be healthy and eat junk? I can't. So I'm not going to engage in something that's going to dishonor me. That's my choice. That's free will. I have free will. I will exercise my free will. And by the way, there's something called discipline in this whole process too. And we're a very undisciplined nation because who of our leaders are disciplined? Bill Clinton? <laughs> Guy goes out for a jog and gains 65 pounds. <laughs> I mean, we don't have healthy models anymore. We don't have a role model that's healthy in the belief systems. They all have these dysfunctions. So we then use that as an excuse. Well, you know, I can't be perfect so I won't be anything. Well, it's not perfection we're seeking. It's to be who we are that we're seeking. And that should be enough. So honor completely in your deed as well as your thoughts. Now, what's more essential? vital, important, and why than what you're using the same time for. In other words, every day you wake up, you put your time and energy into something. What is so important in what you're doing that it's more important than doing something that you want to do that's better for yourself? Do you follow me there? In other words, you, you can't put your energy everywhere. So if where you're putting your energy isn't essential for you, then shouldn't you be changing it and putting it someplace else? The reason you continue to go back to that same energy is for all the reasons we've been discussing, the insecurity and the belief in the wrong choices. <clears throat> what parts of your life are really under your control? What? What parts of your life are under your control? All of your life? If all of your life's under your control, then this is what you've chosen to be? <laughs> I didn't say should. I said what parts of your life are under your control? Huh? Thoughts? Thoughts? Time? Mm -hmm. Your time's under your control if everything you during, do during a day is honoring what your own priorities are and not anyone else's. Now, how many days do you live where everything in that day, time-wise, you've controlled? You think your thoughts are in your control? They can be. What is more important? The substance or the image of a thought or an issue? The um, substance. The substance. Who creates what the substance meaning should be? I do. How did you come up with that creation? By um, 
making decisions. Making a decision against what? What did you measure it against? Everything in life has to be measured against something. It's value to me. The value becomes your reality. Perceptions create reality. Your perception of what should be a healthy thought, a balanced thought, came from someone else. The society, the relationships, other people, what you've read, who you've read. Everything that you've been a part of has created the perceptions of what a positive or complementary thought should be. Therefore, if anything in that process has a reality separate from your own, then you don't have your own thoughts because you don't have your own reality. Your reality is shared with others. Now, how many people actually can say that their thoughts are truly their own? Especially when so many of the thoughts are thoughts that are repeating thoughts about what's not working in their life, or even thoughts that they have that they think are random thoughts, but when they track back the thought, it came from someplace. And reality will create our thoughts. That's why institutions hate the idea that they don't know what's going on in your mind. They like to keep you thinking in a certain way. So proper thinking equates in their mind to social proper being. If you're a person that thinks in a way that goes against what the reality of the group is, they're going to challenge your thoughts. They're going to say, you're thinking stupid. Those are inappropriate thoughts. Well, think, for instance, sexually, how many people have had sexual thoughts that someone else would say, well, that's a very inappropriate thought. That's a bad thought. Mm -hmm. Well, bad for whom? Bad for me or bad for you or bad for your belief system? Of course, my belief system is always changing and being reevaluated as well. Okay, if your belief system's changing, that's healthy because that means your reality's changing. That means your truth is changing because truth is based upon reality. But my reality may be different than yours or yours. Absolutely. Therefore, our truths are going to be different. So therefore, if someone say this is the truth, well, truth by whose definition? What? You can't tell someone your truth is wrong, it's false, it's a lie. Your reality is warped, it's distorted. Your perceptions have been manipulated. Even how you think has been altered. People will not allow that. So they must exclude you. Then, listen carefully what I'm going to say. This is very important. Listen carefully. Everywhere in the world throughout history, we have had the common larger element of truth subvert the common larger reality. That's why we've never anywhere in the world had a mass of people stand up and proclaim their reality. They merely manifest the larger reality. In Russia, when only 200,000 Russians stood up in a country of 180 million in just in Mother Russia, not including the 13 republics, that meant that that was less than a half a percent of the people chose a different reality, chose a different truth. Now what the other people who were not protesting, not in the streets, not defending a new democratic way, they were saying by their lack of assertion, I have accepted or am continuing to be obedient to the old reality, the old truth. Therefore, you couldn't count on them. Unless you took power and control and then you created a new reality, then they become a part of your reality. Well, guess what? When they took control, the reality did not change. Nothing has changed. The truths have not changed. They're the same old system, still corrupt, still totalitarian, still elitist, and still bloody. Look at Chesnia. I mean, we have a president that's talking about uh, withholding aid to countries like Cuba, and we're giving $7 billion to Russia when they've just murdered over 75,000 people who wanted to break away and choose another, another reality, and we're honoring the dictators, we're honoring the tyrants instead of the people who chose the Muslims who are choosing a different reality in Chesnia. And yet, I can see that because my truth is not their truth. I can see it because my perception is not their perception. But the average American cannot and will not. They will not allow their intellect to go to that level. Nor will the news allow themselves to go to that level. Nor will people who share common realities allow a common reality to be challenged. Only within boundaries can that be challenged, only in limited way. In the United States, the height of the Vietnam War, we only had uh, about 700,000 Americans actively protesting it in a country of 235 million at that time. 
that's less than a half a percent. That meant that the common reality, the common perception of truth, the common manipulation of our thought process, the common orthodoxy was so perfect that 99.9% .9 of all Americans sat there and accepted that the reality of that war was inevitable. Now, they didn't want p Americans to get killed, they didn't want their son to get killed, and only when their sons came back and daughters came back in body bags or all crashed up, suddenly did they have their reality threatened. And some changed their reality only at the point where it was broken into pieces. Think of all the Americans that are right now tonight, got heart disease, clogged arteries, have got cancer, the colon, and are going to sit down and have meat and margarine and milk and sugar and dessert and think they're being a good American because they've accepted completely the total reality and total perception of reality, and as a result, they will not challenge it. They are participating in their own demise. So how in the world do you think that anyone is going to look at any larger reality, a different perception, a different truth, when they are so confined to the existing one? Do you think a person's going to change their diet if they couldn't challenge a war? Wrong. They're not going to. Do you think a person is going to sh uh, uh, voice protests against a Waco raid when you could drive a truck through all the inconsistencies and the falsehoods and the lies and deceptions? Wrong. They can't. They've been told what the reality should be on it, officially from on high, and now their truth is it was the right raid. Only those people who have been changed completely are willing to challenge the existing status quo. And unfortunately, many of those people have chose the wrong route to it. Today, they either become anarchists, they drop out, uh, they become so disgruntled, or another whole group of them go in and just rechannel that energy into something that's their own job, but become as compulsive, but they become blind to everything else. They don't have time to protest, they don't have time to vote, they don't have time because they're working on their own thing. They have a new reality, but an old truth. Work hard at what you do, you'll get the rewards to show the success for being your own boss. It's the same old truth. They haven't learned a new truth, a minimalistic truth. See, once you get a whole new truth and a whole new reality, you're going to challenge everything. Everything's up for challenge. Everything. And then, of course, you're going to talk with people who are not going to understand you. I mean, you're going to be such a threat. That's why I don't debate anymore. I just don't debate anymore. I've done a thousand debates. I used to think that if I had all the facts and figures, I'd go in there and I'd debated everywhere. I didn't change a mind. Didn't change anybody. Couldn't. Because I didn't understand at that time they were holding on to a different reality. Therefore, their perceptions, their perception of me. Always one of these, you know, outside, you know, kooks, you know, quacks. I didn't understand that no matter what I said, no matter what I did, no matter who I'd have brought up that I might have helped, they couldn't see it. Their perception would have been blocked and altered. Their boundary, their boundary of what they were allowed to see would have been a screen, smoke screen put up. I'm on the other side of the smoke screen. My successes are on the other side of the smoke screen. They can't see it. They can't feel it. They can't touch it. So they have to continue going back to the same predictable patterns of behavior, the same voices, the same patterns over and over again. Think of that. <clears throat> we only have about 15 minutes to go. I'll try to get through some of these, and what I don't get through now, we'll do in our next month. List the commitments that you're no longer you, you are no longer, uh, are no longer in your best interest to honor. And only you know what you would not honor now. Yes? Okay. Well, no, each person would have different commitments, but the idea is to know how to list them. And that's sometimes painful, but that's creating a new reality. Now, remember, don't try to convince everybody that what you're doing is right. For the very reason I just said, they're not going to understand. Their perception's different. Your perception molds your reality. They're still living by everyone else's perception. What do you do that proves you need to be long? What do you do that proves that you need to be long? 
to belong, to belong. Compromise your values. Compromise your values. What else? What else? Huh? Be like the group. Be like the group. All right? A group consensus. Uh, what else? What? What? Lower your standards. Huh? Lower your standards. Well, no, I'm, you can lower your standards, but the need to belong. Just like the group. Society. Look like them. Look like them, think like them, act like them, live with them. <laughs> All right? You know there's a ghetto mentality. You know what I'm talking about? People feel that that's the best they can do. And therefore they're a victim. And therefore they can't get out of it. Therefore they need to be taken care of. Then there's the suburban mentality. Where they feel protected and isolated. Now ask the person in the suburb, you're living in a very con artificially constructed environment. What if you move five more miles out where you'd be alone in the country? Land would be cheaper, the air would be better, you would have more privacy, you wouldn't have neighbors looking at everything you do every other moment. Oh no, I couldn't do that. That's that need to belong. It's not you trying to touch it, it's them allowing themselves to be open enough. If you do not create a new reality that is uniquely your own, then who in the world's reality are you living through? Huh? Pat Robertson's, <laughs> Pat Robertson's reality you're living through. A lot of people do. Terry, no, no. I don't want anyone living through my reality. Your parents, families, and the people in society. Think of the people who have to live through heroes. It's one thing to look at people in our society who have unique qualities. Like I, I look at a baseball player and I think that person's really good at what they do. And I can honor that person for their unique contributions. But I don't become that person. I don't have to live the way they live. I once went to a Yankee game. That was an unusual experience. <laughs> First off, being an athlete my whole life in all sports, I never will ex I will never forget that experience because all these people were there with their Yankee hats, Yankee coats, and Yankee minds. <laughs> and oh, are they dangerous. I mean, they were Yankee fans. Well, there's nothing worse than a fan who has lost their sense of prospect on that it's just a perspective, it's just a game. It's just some guys hitting a ball with a stick. That's all it is. Nothing more. Don't make it something it's not. But when a guy would strike out, they would boo them and curse them and throw bottles down at him. I'm thinking, how do you think the guy on the field feels? Now, you don't lose your capacity to see a ball unless you've got an injury when it's being thrown at you. But what you can lose is your sense of concentration and your confidence that you can hit the ball. If enough times enough sports writers who are really a disease <laughs> Because A, they've never played the sport, and only a person that plays the sport should have a right, because of their perspective, to comment on it, and they would be far gentler and far more fair than people who have not. You know, th these, these artificial people, that, that they're so reprehensible. It's like a film critic that's never gone and done a film. If you've written, directed, and produced a film, then you want to criticize films, you have a right to. If you haven't, then you have a right not to. And we don't even put the values and, and believe in people who have shown by their own uh, efforts they have this. Well, anyhow, I'm thinking, think if someone writes that you're finished, you're washed up, think if the people start to boo you. You're not focused on the ball now. You're focused on trying to prove to them that you're still capable of, of being able to be someone they should respect. That means you don't really trust that your respect for are good on your own terms. That's why the irony was Ty Cobb was such a great ba a baseball player. He was the greatest baseball player, technically, in the history of the game. Because he didn't care what anyone thought. He didn't like anybody. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean he was a good person. He was not a good person. But he didn't allow the distraction. Today, we have good people who allow themselves to be distracted 
and then they can't play the game. And then we wonder why people don't do well. Because no one can be consistently always focused. So if someone has an off game, then suddenly they start writing about maybe he's 33 and he should retire. Then if he has two or three good games, well, you know, the comeback kid. <laughs> we create a sense of schizophrenia in how we approach these people, but it's dangerous. We have lost the understanding of what sport is. So we put all of our people that we in some way uh, idolize, we put them in the same position. Norma Shear, do you remember who she was? The great actress, a very, very charismatic woman uh, of the 1930s, 40s. She was married to uh, uh, Thalberg, who was the uh, head of MGM. And uh, I thought she was one of the most remarkably facially unique faces I've ever seen. In her latter years, she refused to allow any interviews because she said, I don't want my fans to remember, uh, to look at me now, I want them to remember me as I was. Well, Mary Pickford allowed herself to be interviewed when she was old and clearly at the end of her life. And that's what people remembered. Well, it's unfortunate because we like to think that people are always going to be exactly the way we need them to be. And that's who we give our hero status to. So John Wayne couldn't play, you know, in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. <laughs> even if he fed in the shoes. Because we wouldn't want someone who represented this kind of all-American mystique, you know, being in drag. And, and we didn't expect him to be in a comedy either. We kind of always wanted to see him sauntering out, you know, like in that strange walk of his, and in the searchers. That's what we wanted. Now, he honored that. Because he honored that, people still kept him in that mindset. What does it do to a person who has to be consistent to the public's desire for them? What do they compromise in order to maintain that image? Could you imagine the pressure? And then we wonder why a lot of these people don't want to be around the public. They want to live away from them. They want to isolate themselves from them. They only want to be there when they have to perform and period, otherwise they're out. Because I have been around a lot of celebrities. I've counseled a lot of celebrities. They're just normal people. They're absolutely no different than you or I. They spend their days the same way as the average American does. As insignificant, as boring, as incidental as anyone else. They just have more time on their hands. And they don't want people to see that. They want you to see the mystique. If you saw how they really are, you'd think, well, gee whiz, you know, it's kind of not a whole lot different than Helen next door, and <laughs> why am I, I'm not enamored by Helen, you know. I must, I'm not going to be enamored by you. So we create artificial images and then we honor the artificial image. Heaven forbid that anything happens. And what generally happens is a, a sexual scandal unless a person is a sexual being. I mean, could you imagine someone saying that Madonna was caught having, you know, wild sex? People say, yeah, and, and so. But if someone says, you know, uh, that someone that we wouldn't expect it from, then oh, oh, the image, loss of image, loss of value, loss of respect. Why? That means the only power they had was an artificial power in perception. Therefore, power resides in perception. Therefore, power is always an illusion. Power cannot exist unless the perception of power exists. Without a perception of power, there is no power. Now that's a, a unique concept because then it changes what we could do feeling disempowered with our own lives. The only way that we then have to get power is to perceive what we can do in our life to create power. What would you do in your life as of tomorrow to create power to become more powerful in your own life? What? What could you do to become more powerful in your own life? What? Start believing in yourself because then you're creating a perception that you're believing in something that is power. You're giving power to an image, the image of who you want to be. Therefore, you're not going to be following the path of someone else. You've given your power to other people. You've given it to a feminist or you've given it to, to an athlete or you've given it to a, a politician or, or, or a Gandhi. You've given power because you've so respected what they've done or been an ember about what they do, but then you take away power from yourself in the process if you, you can have respect for what people do. You, you can honor that, but never to the exclusion of being on your own path. Most people are on someone else's path figuring it must be better because it works for them, why wouldn't it work for me? You don't know what works in a person's life. 
You're not in their life. You don't know what they have to go through. I've never met a celebrity that was happy, balanced, or healthy. And yet it, you wouldn't know that from the image they're able to spin. So power is all about being able to have a healthier perception of who we could be when we become the person that we ultimately should be, our real self. So that's where our energy should be focused. Last two questions on this. <clears throat> Compare your goal needs from your earlier ones and societies. Now that makes a big separation. Write down what your goals are, write down what society's goals for you are, and see where they are the same or different. In all likelihood, the more goals you have that are uniquely meeting your own needs are going to go against what society wants for you, which case you're going to have to create a new life. Now, are there people out there, are there resources, are there jobs, are there things to do? You bet. Go out to Santa Fe. The whole city is made up of new people who've changed their life over. Go to Taos, go to Tucson, uh, go to Boulder, go, go uh, to Salt Lake. You'll find people from all over Dallas, people going and starting life all over again. With their values is the first value they're honoring. Now, it doesn't mean that you're antisocial. It means that you're no longer going to obey by a, a societal standard and a societal goal that does not meet the essential self the real authentic self needs. Suddenly you feel liberated and free. And then you don't have the other insecurities of the things that you don't have in your life. You're not concerned about what you don't have. You're just the fact you have time to wake up in the morning. I have a buddy that is out in Hawaii. And he, he was having a lot of problems with life here. And he wakes up each day and he's in a community up there. And there's a lot of artists and, and writers and thinkers and athletes. And I said, what did you do today? And he tells me what he did. And it's nothing that many people would think is constructive, but it's his day. He constructed it based upon his terms, not society's. He works what he wants to work. Could you imagine if you only worked the hours you needed to work to justify the lifestyle that you wanted and no more? The rest of the time you gave to yourself. Well, that's what he's done. So he didn't have a big house. He didn't have any house. He has an apartment, but he has a view of the ocean. He goes down to a waterfall each morning that's in his backyard. He picks fruit. He hangs out with artists. He does writing. He does a lot of stuff. He's happy. All the other things he spent his life doing was successful but didn't create happiness. And therefore, he wasn't successful in a personal way. What is more important? Now, this we went through, the substance of a thing or its image. By the way, most of the benefits in our society come from the image of what you create. If you create the image that you are in control, we will give you uh, our strengths. If you create the image that you are not in control but you're being honest and vulnerable, we, we get away from you in a hurry because societal images only have people in power positions who are in absolute control. We don't want vulnerable people. Therefore, honest, sensitive, vulnerable people never get into positions of power. So we keep repeating the same mistakes with people in power, lies, deceptions. All they do is manicure and make a twist on their image. But the image is what we care about. So we keep getting image control people who twist everything to represent and repackage a new image. But what about the substance? Ask any politician an honest question about substantive issues and they never answer you. Never. Nor do journalists. When I ask a, 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 a man working for a television network, would he tell me about what went on at the Bilderberg Group, there, where the, one of the presidents of his network attended? He says, no. I says, well, you'd ask someone else and expect an answer and say they were covering up. Then what are you doing? It's a strange society. If your life could be perfectly balanced, where would you put more time and energy? This is our last question. If your life could be perfectly balanced, where would your time and energy be placed? Now, what I want you to do is not only to think about this, but to put it in this perspective. In the ideal life, where that time and energy should, that's where you should start to construct your ideal life. Because anything less, 
is wasting a life and you can't live it again, this is not a dress rehearsal. So start to put it where you feel the energy and time should be. And that way, that's power in itself. Just shifting the emphasis. Remember, a lot of what you've done was expected. You've honored everyone else's notions of you being the good person, the right person, but that doesn't mean you've honored your real self. It's time to honor the real self. Time and energy are the only two things that you have that are uniquely your own. The moment you give them to anyone for any reason other than what is essential for yourself, you are denying the self. That creates conflicts on a spiritual level. That creates conflicts on a physical level. That creates the disease. That creates the negative perceptions and that creates the artificial boundaries. That creates a false reality, and that creates a frustration. And that's it for our discussion.